Thanks, Arlen. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited that you're back with us. If you've joined us again, like Arlen said, this is the series uh, of webinars that we're doing related directly to explicit instruction. But today's webinar will really help you understand some of the myths associated with um, instructional fallacies, so to speak. And what I want to do is like maybe a disclaimer at the beginning when we start. I was telling Arlen, I go, sometimes, you know, people have done a certain thing for so long and they're so vested in it that when they hear perhaps that maybe it doesn't have the most effect on students, they might have a little bit of a negative reaction. So I want you to bear with me through this. And I want you to just kind of follow along because we have it set up in a, a system that I think you'll really enjoy is it'll talk about the myth, we'll talk about some um, assumptions that people make, we'll talk about the research, and we'll just kind of make everybody at ease, hopefully by the time we get going. So the big thing we want to talk about through here, obviously, is what is our outcomes for having the webinar be successful. So let's take a quick look here. And you're all adults. I, I always hate reading these kinds of things to everybody. Um, but I just want you to kind of take a look and see what we're going to look at here. Obviously, we're going to explore and discuss educational myths and those what what many times people call or in our area when we work with Anita Archer is a suicides. <laughs> and we want to provide clarifications like I discussed and some evidence to understand what the research states. And then we'll also talk a little bit about um, reviewing, applying the evidence to the myth that we're going to have um, presented. And then obviously we want to take an idea and make it more understandable and make the explicit instruction working memory, um, concepts versus novices versus experts that relates back to explicit learn instruction and struggling learners and problem-based learning too. So we're going to kind of go through all these things that build up to demonstrating why explicit instruction is important and get started. So um, I'm doing this just as a quick overview. If you were with us last time, I apologize, but our purposes, one is to see what you know about an explicit instruction and what you maybe need to know. So you might not be the person that you were just affirming what you already know about explicit instruction. So that's a yes, you got it. You understand it when we're going through this information. Sometimes we want to remind you it's a reminder because, you know, everybody goes to all these trainings and you know, it's just cognitive overload. And you're like, something might trigger your memory and you're like, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I, I got this. Um, some people want, you know, at the point of their learning that they expanded and there's some concepts you're familiar with, with but you're, you're still thinking, I'm not quite, a, not quite a, an aficionado at this yet. And then obviously apply what you've learned and you can say, oh, yeah, I get this. I can pull this together and start using this um, immediately in, in the situation that I'm in in the school. So with that, let's go ahead and move forward. A big thing on these webinars, I don't know about you guys, but are you Zoomed out? I, I know that we really try on some of these, or at least I try to make sure that it's active participation. And so just really quickly, I'm gonna go through these. I try to do this on every one of these webinars just to remember and remind folks that um, the importance of active, active participation, because if not, these are pretty, pretty dry and boring webinars, right? And there's a lot of content in these. So let's take a quick look here. Obviously, I'm a note taker, so everybody maybe need a piece of paper and have that in front of them so they can write down their ahas or questions you might have. At times, we'll ask you to drop that into the chat as well to try to get this going back and forth so we have that inter, uh, you know, interconnectedness. Sometimes we'll do short choral responses. There are several quotes in this one. So we might even try that strategy more. So we'll do, obviously you're muted. So a choral response is just you talking through the, the response or a choral reading. Again, you're muted. We could do a closed reading. And I don't think in this one that we're doing a closed reading, but that's one of the engagement strategies that we looked at for active participation and best practices and, and the takeaways from that that you'll get throughout the, the entire presentation. I'm a speed talker. I'm Italian. I can't talk with my hands, so my mouth goes really fast on these. So I will try to slow down, but I also keep thinking in the back of my mind, I only got minutes. So if you could just hit the chat box and say, hey, I didn't catch that. So be sure to hold me accountable as well. All right. And then, like I said, there's the questions. We'll use the chat box for anything that you might have coming up. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is a a series of six webinars Arlen mentioned, and it is all about explicit, based off of explicit instruction by uh, Dr. Anita Archers and Dr. Charles Hughes. I was lucky enough to be um, recruited kind of. Anita wanted some folks around the country that she's recruited and she still recruits people to become a trainer of trainer for her work. Um, I don't know, I, I hate to guess how old Anita is now, but she's in her eighties and has been doing this work for, you know, since <laughs> a good 60 years. So. 
Um, she's super passionate about explicit instruction. And if you've ever had the chance to meet Anita or be trained by Anita or just have a one hour session with her, you would really be impressed by um, the level of knowledge she has and what an applicator she is. Like when it, any modeling strategy, anything that she puts out, she's tried it, she's done it in a classroom, she probably recorded it to share with others. And like I said, she just wants this work to carry on. So I was lucky enough to meet up with a crew in Portland, Oregon, and we all worked through um, her explicit instruction trainer trainers module. And like I said, she still holds meetings with us, has web monthly webinars to share information. So we're up to date on things that she feels are important. And as it relates to the work that her and Dr. Hughes did together. So that's that part. So the miss and education part is there, there's always been, and I don't quite understand this because I, I, I use research a lot when I design plans or programming for schools or when I work on curriculum and instruction for schools. And I was surprised that there were so many myths that people misunderstood, right? And sometimes as soon as you say explicit instruction, one of the things is like, well, that's a special ed project. I'm like, eh, no, that's not technically what we're talking about. And sometimes, you know, in education, we label things in little silos and we bundle them together and the people are like, well, that doesn't apply to me. Now, this is about what good quality instruction looks like, right? And when do we use it? And when's it appropriate? And what's the research say? So let's go ahead and just jump in and take a look at some of these myths. Now, again, bear with me. If you get your feathers ruffled, just hang in there, drop it in the comment box. Let's have some dialogue or I'll even be happy to stay on a few minutes after if you wanna have a further conversation about something that comes up. At least I've piqued your interest and you're excited to see oh, what are some of these myths that might come up. So the first two we're gonna talk about are the first myth, students learn best when they discover things on their own. So that's the first myth. And the next myth is students learn better when they are taught using their preferred learning style. Now, I've been teaching and doing these courses and being an administrator and uh, working as a curriculum instruction for uh, quite a few years, let's just say. And I think this is my third, 29th year in education. So when I think of some of these things, boy, I can remember the days of learning styles, right? And I can remember the things of discovery and people still use these. And, and let me preface all these myths by saying, there's probably nothing wrong. We just wanna use what's best, right? Cause we don't have time to waste. So. With these two myths, what are one of the myths that you see here that maybe you've had an experience with one of these myths? Have you had experience with students learn best when they discover things on their own? Or have you had a, um, something that you ran into as students learn best when they are taught using their preferred learning style? Anybody have any thoughts on what those, what your thoughts are on one of those myths? If you could just drop it in the chat box. This is the hardest part to get the first person to go and then we can have a conversation. <clears throat> Anybody school just use the discovery method? Anybody really tied strongly to learning styles and you know everything we do is related to that. Have heard, practiced and believed both. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? There is a nugget of truth in both. Great, Shelly, thanks. Uh, with the second one, sometimes it is how parents make requests for teachers. Interesting, huh? And Sherry's had experience with discovery and learning styles have been debunked, Amy's telling us. Well, Amy, you're gonna enjoy this class. <laughs> I wish there's like a laughing little emoji on here so I could chime in, but then I get really lost and you'd all be like, okay, what's the point? So let's go on and see through. Thanks for sharing. Um, discovery can lead to some assumptions, absolutely. And so as we go through, we're going to have this kind of dispelled myth, right? So let's see how this is set up for everybody. So here we go. Your chat, you've chatted about it. So in the last, I just saw Marissa put something up here too. I feel like education programs in college really push the first idea. So they really push this idea of discovery. Well, let's go ahead and take a look about. So obviously, if we take that first one, students learn best when they discover things on their own. Kind of take a look at it. Here's the assumption, right? Students learn best. Uh, they'll learn more, retain more, transfer more information if they've discovered the information. So instantly I have a couple red flags go off when I see this, like, but, but that's probably how I was trained versus how other teachers might've been trained. So again, these are what Anita would call a suicides or assumptions, right? We committed a suicide. We just assumed that, you know, obviously they would learn more, retain more, transfer more information if they discovered it on their own. 
a lot of things come up when I think of that. So let's kind of clarify a couple things too. So we want to clarify what is unguided or discovery, you know, and, and minimally guided instruction, because in the research, you might see it both ways. So one of the pieces that I think we want to kind of talk through here is, because I think you've all kind of hit, kind of hit the head on having an experience with it. It's on this one. Let's do um, just a quick read aloud. We're going to do on one side of this argument are those advocating the hypothesis that people learn best in an unguided or minimally guided environment, generally defined as one in which learners, rather than being presented with essential information, must discover or construct essential information for themselves. So when I think of that, I think of a lot of things. I used to run the Title I grant for the state, and we had a lot of struggling readers, right? We had a lot of struggling mathematicians. And when we think of some of these things, I instantly have that question like, okay, well, how do they discover things that they don't know? Does anybody else have some ideas on what this might, you know, trigger or how this might work positively for your group? I think the one thing is to make sure we understand, you know, unguided or minimally guided instruction, which would probably be, you know, counterintuitive to what explicit instruction is. So let's make that kind of pull through for everybody. So this is the argument on this side. And, and Maureen had a great thing here. Students need to be self-starters and motivated. Interesting, that, that's, that's a good point. What is the point of teachers if students just discover it all on their own? Well thought through, Alec, that's a great premise. Seems like they would take a really long time. You're right, wouldn't that take forever? It would go on and on. And how do you assess what students discover? Right. And I think this kind of learning by meandering, who has time, right? That's the first thing I thought of, who has time to meander? And students need background information or scaffolding. Gold star, Amy, I think of that as a reading teacher and you think of, you know, when you introduce things to students and they're, it falls flat and you're like, well, I just assume kids, uh, first graders knew about the zoo or I just assume kids knew about what a farm was. And again, it goes back to that assume side, right? We assume kids know something instead of being explicitly and direct about some of these things. And I know there's a lot of folks that'll get into a conversation around it, but there'll be things coming out that you'll see when this is appropriate, right? And when this is not a way, you know, using discovery or guide, you know, minimally guided instruction works. So um, great, great answers, everybody. Thanks for participating. So let's do some clarification, right? What education approaches are unguided or minimally guided? And so, Boy, I've seen these all in high school settings. I've seen these in middle schools. And I know people start to feel a little uncomfortable here, like discovery, maybe not so much. I know in the pre-kindergarten that I worked with, they have, discovery is huge, right? And it's a little different in that situation. Um, and then problem-based learning, inquiry learning, experiential learning, and constructionist learning, right? So these are the pieces that are just, if we're going to take a container and put them in, this is the unguided or minimally guided. Doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It just means that's where that part lies. Um, and, I, and, and somebody just posted, you know, both are necessary for learning. Absolutely. But we're just kind of clarifying. So everybody's on the same page of what is it that minimally guided or unguided is, right? So you have a direct concrete example. So those are those examples. And if um, we go on, we're going to talk through um, who's kind of dispelled some of these things. So John Hattie, who I would say, if you had the opportunity, and I'm, I'm like a shameless plug for this man, every time I have a thing, a webinar, or I'm working on research, it always goes back to his work, because quite frankly, who has got that many meta-analyses laying around that they can go back and take a look at for programming and designing curriculum and instruction? And if you are a teacher, or if you're a curriculum and instruction leader, or if you're a principal, these are all one of these, or a, a group of these books are what's important. I really think I would call that book number one, the Bible, and we're kind of hit on what that might look like. Um, it's the instructional Bible, really, because we don't have time to waste in instruction, and we don't have and time is the number one commodity that teachers don't have, and nothing's worse than starting a new program, project, lesson, whatever, knowing that, you know, it's good. It's not maybe the best effort we could do because we know the impact or the outcome might be a little better if we did something different. So in Hattie's work, you'll always see this, it looks like a protractor or a little um, you know, a little half sun, half moon, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but when we go into it, Hattie goes into each of these things with effect sizes. So he takes a, a giant, I think he has, must have 80,000 for grad assistants that he just works to death because it's amazing the amount of work that goes through here. 
Um, and so when we look at this, we look at what does it mean? And so for effect sizes might be new for some folks that are on the call and on the webinar. So if we take a look, we can look in this case, it goes to negative two, a reverse effect, all the way over to 1.2. And anything 0.4 and over is a good effect, right? So in this example, we're just showing you that teacher-student relationships is, has a positive effect size of 0.72. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm sure if the teacher's horrible, <laughs> There might be a, re a reverse effect, but it's about having relationships with students, meaningful relationships, right? And so how important those are. Huge, huge, huge effect on student learning. So let's go ahead and move forward. Caddy's work, again, if I pull out all the pieces of explicit instruction and I look at certain things that make up that whole umbrella of explicit instruction of all the strategies that might be used or some of the things that may not be used, um, I wanted to show some, some comparisons for folks, right? So if I take a look here, obviously explicit instruction has a 0.57 uh, effect, direct instruction has a 0 0.60, and, and there is a difference between the two, direct instruction and explicit instruction. Um, mastery learning, 0.57, goals, 0.68. And if I let you kind of read through all these on this column all the way over through here, we would see that everything over here has a a 0.4 or greater, obviously the lowest one's 0.48. But if we really look at them, we realize, wow, there's, there's, there's some things that if I concentrated on this, I would probably have a lot of effect with my students. What I wanna draw your eyes to down here is some of the things that we continue to do, because I have been in buildings that still struggle with some of this because there are still some believers in whole language and look at the effect size. This is normally when the presentation gets a little, you know, everybody's, it depends on where you're at on that, right? So I always say to everybody, again, the data doesn't lie in this regard, the whole language, the program, if you have that kind of programming, it's a 0 0.06 effect. You have time to waste, right? You have to find an instructional program that meets the needs of all your students. Um, Discovery-based teaching, if you just did that alone, 20.21. Problem-based learning, 0.26. Inquiry learning, 0.21. And student control over learning, 0 0.02. Um, I just put these in here for everybody to have the opportunity to think through some of this, because I know you're reflecting on the charts and thinking, huh, what are these things that we do? What are the things we do really well? And what things programming wise do we do that maybe we need to take a look at and think, huh, is that the best thing? Because I can tell you right now, some of these take a lot of time, right? And I'll get into some of these that work, but, but they work in context. So when we take things out of context, sometimes that has a point too. Um, just a quick thing about Hattie as well. If you see 2014, 2017, and 2018, it's because they redo these um, calculations every, every however many years. And so these were recalculated and the responses have been updated all the way through 2018. So it's not like it has changed much. Sometimes though, I mean, just, you know, it, it'll adjust a little bit, but nothing to the point of where it's not, um, you know, a positive effect. So when I think of these things, I, I always have these questions when I look at this. It seems so simple to me. Like, why aren't we doing better for our kids if we know these things don't have a positive effect, right? I don't have time. You don't have time. And that's the number one thing we as educators complain about. We don't have time and the resources to do these kinds of things. So I guess the question I always have is to consider with your colleagues or with us today, what areas have high effect, obviously? What areas have a lower effect? And why do educators continue to use programs, strategies, et cetera, that have such low effect? So I'm gonna go back, the high effect ones and the low effect. If you could drop into the chat and tell me which ones you think have the highest effect, some of the highest effect. Or if you feel like saying, I wonder why teachers continue to do things that they know aren't maybe, or maybe they don't know, right? What are your thoughts? Which ones have the highest effect? And maybe the one question about why do, you know, why do we continue to do things we know that aren't maybe as effective when I look at the bottom corner? Anybody have any thoughts? RTI, scaffolding and classroom discussions, correct. And do you know, and I hate to say this and I never say this really, but um, as a person that ran federal programs, the federal government would always roll these things out and it would aggravate me to death. And I'd be like, oh. and you know how many years ago they rolled out RTI and told us how good, you know, how, the, you know, and strategies and reading interventions. I, you know, like I said, I've been in this uh, almost 30 years this year. That happened 20 years ago. And I, I, I really struggle with that question of we've known that, we've known these things, but sometimes we still struggle with holding on to these older things, right? That 
maybe don't have the effect we want. So thanks for sharing. Um, one here too, teachers rely on what they've done before. Absolutely. And why invent the real, why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> maybe it's laziness. No, it's conditioned behavior. Think about it. If you, you know, it, it's how you, you, everything you do, it was modeled to you. That was a great way of, you know, showing that I, I probably not laziness, but it's what you know at the time, right? Um, I love that Bridget comments. She's I'm loving that RTI has a, such a high impact. We are effect. We are seeing that in our school since we revamped our MTSS program, probably because Bridget, you're addressing behavior and you're addressing academics on both sides when you do an MTSS program. So that's awesome. That I, and you're looking at the root cause of life. And you collectively teach everybody how to behave or how to respond or how to create, you know, it's kind of levels those fields. So that's exciting to hear. Um, I'm not sure on this one, the why problem-based learning. Um, I don't know if that's a question or if that's just someone still kind of hanging on why problem-based learning is there. And Sandy, I'll have an answer to that for you because I thought the same thing initially. And then I'm like, no, I, I, I assume something. <laughs> so um, awesome, Lindsay, you just started working through visible learning with Corwin and the school year. Great, that is awesome. And I see an RTI aid math getting frustrated with computer-based test. Yeah, just kind of looking at some of these things. Um, hopefully when you know better, you do better. That's a great adage, right? So once you've been awakened, so to speak, or you know more, right? And I always preach to people, read your research, take, take time once a week. And I know it sounds crazy, but read, you know, a five page article, a four page article. I know other things call, but sometimes you find this that saves you time <laughs> versus in the weeds on something that, you know, doesn't save you time. So I think that's a big thing is being that conditional learner, always learning and, and never afraid to um, learn new things and understand new things. And then Sandy, why push for problem-based learning if it's not effective? Well, and, and well, exactly. That's kind of what I struggle with when I started getting deeper into Hattie's work. I'm like, man, this makes way too much sense. I don't understand why we don't do what we do, right? Um, and I, when we look at these things, we kind of go forward and we, we talk through this of what, what has low effect, what has a high effect. And when we take a look at what is the evidence, research shows that when teachers actively teach students, they have over three times the effect on students' results than they do when they try to facilitate learning, right? So, it, you know, I can tell you that probably 20 years ago, we were pushed to be facilitators of learning over and over and over. And um, I think, it, you know, the pendulum swings and how things work in education, but we really had to start thinking about what is it that we need before we can do some of those things, right? So there has to be some direct explicit instruction, the form of foundation for kids. And I think that's what you'll start to see when we go into some of the stuff, but three times and more effective, uh, you know, on student results than when they try to facilitate their learning. So again, and teachers make a difference. That's a big piece here. Um, and we're going to do some quotes to notes as well as we work through this. So Mayer concluded that the debate about discovery had been replayed many times in education, but each time the evidence has favored a guided approach to learning. So again, like we've had this conversation, I, you know, I've been in it for 30 years and we've had this conversation since I've been in it. And I think, you know, new, new staff coming into the field probably you're still hearing some of these things and I wonder how some of these things when we know they don't have this effect still continue to just linger out there and perhaps because we've not dispelled the myth right so we keep seeing some of these pieces of evidence so again we're, we're looking here and in this and obviously this researcher was in 2004 concluded that the debate about discovery has been replayed and he's right over and over and over we we replay this and it's it's that crying times in education that sometimes we just can't get off that dead horse. <laughs> um, here's another piece of evidence, right? Because we're going to work through this process. So if you want to read with me, you can, or if you can just listen to my boring voice, I'll go ahead and read it to you though. Although unguided or minimally guided instructional approaches are very popular and intuitively appealing, because everybody likes, they appeal, to, they appeal to a lot of people. The point is made that these approaches ignore both the structures that constitute human cognitive architecture and evidence from empirical studies over the past half century that consistently indicate that minimally guided instruction is less effective and less efficient than instructional approaches that place a strong emphasis on the guidance of student learning progress. And so I think that that's pretty, pretty moving, right? And I think we're just getting into some of these things because we're really understanding cognitive architecture, right? We're learning how much cognitive overload sometimes that we put on things and why things don't move to long-term or short-term memory, even heck, some days I can't remember what I had for breakfast, right? Depending on what it is that I'm involved in and how cognitively stretched I am. 
But I really think that understanding this over and over and over for a half a century, we've known that minimally guided instruction is less uh, effective. Now that makes sense, right, to everybody? But yet we still go out and do some things um, and continue on the idea of, um, you know, jumping in feet first, or if I see like still the whole language, that, that was a big one for me that I would go out and see a round robin reading. Why, why, why do we continue to do things we know have no effect? So let's keep on pushing through and the evidence continues, right? So this again goes back to our series of webinars directly related to explicit instruction and how these misalign to that in particular. So explicit instruction is directly about teaching new information. So you're kind of going to see how this helps that myth. Teaching novices, this is not experts, right? So you can kind of start seeing now how this all starts to lay out. And teaching struggling learners, right? So explicit instruction for these three topics is exactly what it should be used for. We're teaching new information, they're novices or they're struggling readers and struggling learners in, in any content area. But if you think about it, that would make sense because why would you want someone and somebody noted it actually in their in the chat box about well what how are they going to learn anything if we just throw them in and you know sink or swim kind of thing if you can't read how are you going to learn to read right or if you have no background information on a topic and we just throw you into it you, you struggle for for a while you know or or you just shut down so the evidence continues so on this first one we've talked through this first myth right and what I wanted everybody to do is think about how we started back up in here about those two things to consider. And I'm probably making y'all car sick. Um, students learn best when they discover things on their own. So when we think of that and we go back down to all the way at the very end and we reflect of the evidence and the assumptions and the things that have gone on and how they tie back to explicit instruction and 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 how this part of inst explicit instruction is like that basic learning, why the explicit instruction is important. Why do you, what are some of your thoughts on the things that we covered as it related to effect sizes? Maybe it's things that you do that you think, wow, I didn't know they weren't very effective or things you do really well and you've had a positive experience with things that are extremely effective. What ahas do you have? What questions do you still need answered? And if you could, I'll just drop them in the chat box. And again, we don't have to have a hundred people do. Hey, Maureen, I'll get back to you at the very end on collector teacher efficacy, okay? Anything else? And Sandy had a good point earlier, but why, why push for problem-based learning if it isn't effective? We're going to talk, like I said, we're going to cover that at the very end. We're going to go through it. Anybody else? Just some ahas, any shocking things. I know I was shocked on a few of them. So, but again, that's been several years ago that I was shocked. Anymore, I'm not shocked about anything, it seems like, in this world. So um, somebody was surprised problem-based learning is so low. I thought it was higher. Yep, exactly. So let's go ahead and keep moving through. And we'll just see, it strikes me that leadership is so needed to help teachers make these decisions. <laughs> Interesting, right? But I, I don't know, I think it's that power of the collective whole. And, and maybe that's a little bit about the collective teacher efficacy and, and understanding, you know, once, I, I don't know, one voice versus many voices leading everybody forward. Um, and I think it goes back to somebody's earlier comment. It's you normally teach what you were taught or teach how you were taught, right? And you have to break that cycle or reflect on it at least and think, ah, oh, maybe some of that's not the greatest strategies to use. So this is about new information, right? So what is the information that we have or evidence we have on new information? So when we take a look at some of this, it says, obviously, the quote of note is controlled experiments almost uniformly indicate that when dealing with novel information, so that's information that is new to learners, novel, novice Students should be explicitly shown what to do and how to do it, and then have an opportunity to practice doing it while receiving corrective feedback. Now, as a building principal, I do walkthroughs and I'd see things, and I can tell you, probably 90% of the times, people got this. But there was always the one person that I was like, 
holy moly, she's already jumping in and having them analyze things. I don't think these kids had any background information on this. And so early on, I, again, years ago when we learned that what were one of the big things about teaching students how to read was obviously activating prior knowledge and activating background knowledge, right? And kids weren't successful and didn't have that in, in the context, context of reading or any context context. So I do find, though, that people sometimes struggle with being explicit. And I find that in adults that even that I work with, like, I'll say, hey, can you write those directions down? Because I heard you, but I don't know that that's what you want us to do. So even as adults, we need somebody to explicitly telling us things, especially, again, if it's new information that we've not had, it's novel information. And think of how many times that happens to our students, right? All, a lot of the stuff that we give kids is new information. And especially, I would think, you know, especially if you have a, if you're a struggling learner, if you're learning, a, you know, that has to learn, um, you know, English and, and try to understand two languages to try to convert that into all the information that you need. Obviously, understanding this idea of new information or novel information needing explicit instruction and direct instruction. And again, the important piece here is the feedback piece. You know, feedback really doesn't cost anything. It's one of the highest effect sizes, and it's probably one of the ones we do correctly um, the least, right? feedback, feedback, feedback. I can remember, I don't know if you can remember back to your high school days, you'd write a paper and it might come back to you like the week before the term was over. And you're like, oh, that's what I got on it, you know? And writing such a process that when you teach writing, you really need immediate feedback and have them in, the, in that material working and revising and rewriting, uh, learning the process of writing. And so sometimes I always struggle with feedbacks you know, if we teach everybody how to do effective feedback, that's the key, effective, <laughs> and use it appropriately, it's one of the cheapest, most positive things we can do for students. And so, and we had a great thing here. Let's see, since the pandemic shut down, so many academic gaps have been created. Explicit instruction seems like the way to fill in those holes. Absolutely. I I'm glad you said that, Maureen, because that's kind of what we get to as we move through, through the slides. So absolutely. And sometimes, again, it goes back to Anita's big premise of a suicide. We assume from grade level to grade level, kids get it. They're not getting it, you know, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of the stuff as we go through. In fact, here comes the slide I was thinking of. So I look at this and this is new information, right? If we look at grade level, here's some of the things, kindergartners, letter sound association, first grade strategy for determining meanings of words, using context clues. And if we go through this all the way through, it just gives you a grade level and the example of new information that they receive. On the many times that I visited schools and the, and the things that we've worked on related to either, you know, English language arts or mathematics, we look at, you know, third grade, the concept of fractions. I could move this probably all the way down to middle school and I could probably put it in high school as well, because no matter when I met with high school staff, middle school staff, the thing they gripe about the most in mathematics was kids don't know how to do fractions. And I, it goes back to here when we introduce it, kids don't know place value in number sense. So if we didn't get the explicit direct instruction components of learning the basics all the way back, you know, first, second grade, and we move on to the concept of fractions and they never mastered those, we again committed suicide because they were given that information, but they never mastered it. It affects them all the way down here in, in middle school and high school. And I don't know if I have any math teachers looking on here, but they probably would raise their hand and say, oh yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we just need to stop provide those students with that. And, and I think the thing when we said the pandemic shut down, the, the gaps you're going to have, you need to stop and do two weeks direct instruction related to those gaps that are, they're showing up having. And so again, I, fractions, it's number sense, which seems crazy by the time you get to middle school or high school, you don't have number sense um, and, and understanding some of those things. But it is some of those basics that we forget about. And again, we go back to a, committing a suicide. Um, Alex has got a comment here. It says, when English teachers have a lot on their plate, I'm aware that timely feedback is what's best, but as one teacher with so many papers, it's difficult. So Alex, I can tell you, I was a middle school, high school English teacher. And let me tell you, I, I can understand what you're saying, but I kind of had to make that commitment to providing that feedback, which totally stinks. And depending on your class sizes, right? You had to deal with that. But there were many unfortunate weekends that that's what I did, giving kids feedback, because again, it was so important to that process of writing. So I totally side with you. But let me tell you, I also didn't put on my whistle and my um, my shorts and my t-shirt because I couldn't go in and be the, the teacher in, the, um, in physical education because I couldn't stand the noise, right? So there's a trade-off between all these things we do. Uh, and if we really want to be good at what we do, 
kind of have to figure out a way to make that work. And so yeah, there's ways to do it, but you're right. It does take a lot of time. Um, but Sandy said that that's why she pretests each unit in algebra. Absolutely. I mean, I, if I could have a dollar for every time middle school or high school teachers told me how their kids don't know fractions, I could have, I could have retired a long time ago. So, so let's keep moving through this. What's the evidence on novices, right? We're going to keep talking and trying to figure out some of these, these myths. Um, decades of research clearly demonstrate that for novices, it's comprising literally any more of all students, right? With the pandemic, we're kind of novices in so many areas. Direct explicit instruction is more effective and more efficient than partial guidance, right? And so when teaching new context and skills to novices, teachers are more effective when they provide explicit guidance accompanied by practice and feedback, not when we require students to discover many aspects of what they must learn. And quite frankly, let's be honest, the last two and a half, three years when we would go remote, that might be what kids had done, depending on what school district you were and how immersed you were in technology and how good your staff were at it, right? So when we keep thinking of these things, this is the novice. These are the kids that are just beginning. We really have to understand why that direct explicit information is so important to them and not just jump to the next piece because you know we're in a hurry and we gotta get things done because these kids gotta move. Um, this is a big piece too, and, and there's so much research now on working memory. And I think, you know, I try to do this. You'll see that little dog in uh, the ahas. I normally put more in, but on these hour webinars, I kind of have to think about it a little differently because we have such limited time. But on here, the quote to note, obviously, is our understanding of the role of long-term memory in human cognition has altered dramatically over the last few years, right? So we know a lot more about working memory. Anybody that's in special education, I'm sure is so sick of hearing about working memory, but it's fascinating to me because I totally understood this for a long time. I just didn't have the research back it. And now we have the research. So long-term memory is now viewed as the central dominant structure of human cognition. So think about that. Think about your memory as an, as an older person. Think about it. I say older, but older than students, you know, work with me on this. <laughs> um, and then understanding that long-term memory, how do we move things to long-term memory, right? So that little dog and those aha moments and putting things to paper and slowing down and thinking about what we talked about during these sessions forces you to think about it and hopefully move it to long-term memory. So it also defines here what working memory is the cognitive structure in which Conscious processing occurs. So like the working memory is where we do all the work and it's got limitations. So when we do in our working memory, there's two characteristics. Obviously we're processing novel information, new information, and it's very limited in the duration and capacity. Again, I couldn't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So um, my working memory must not have been working so great. But these are those two pieces that we really have to think about when we design lessons. And when we think about how we instruct kids, so there's such limitations, right? So if you're teaching a new concept and it's really heavy, you got to really think through how do we break it down? How do we scaffold it? How do we get it to where we can move that process to long-term memory? And, you know, I think Marzano does a great job of defining all the strategies that work for a lot of those things, as well as many, many researchers that have been working on this for the last 15 years. And also the limitations of working memory only apply to new yet to be learned information that has not been stored in long-term memory. In contrast, when dealing with previously learned information stored in long-term memory, these limitations disappear. So if you think of two databases, right, it's the one database that, you know, you're erasing, you're erasing everything out of it. And the long-term memory is where you're storing stuff out of it. And something made you move that to long-term memory. It probably was pencil to paper or whatever strategy that's learned that helps you move those um, things to long-term memory. And sometimes, like I said, slowing down reflection, feedback, all those things help move things in working memory along. And so that's a big thing that we have to really think about is overwhelm kids. And think about it, you got 30 kids in the classroom and everybody learns differently in that regard of how they process. And so how do we set up those things so we can actually think about moving things to, from short-term to long-term memory? Because it doesn't do any good if they can't conjure up all those you know, functions of mathematics if it's just short-term memory. How do we move it to the long-term? Uh, and we know, again, it's the central dominant structure of human cognition. So if we don't get there, then that's why kids struggle. Um, again, this talks about working memory and what's the evidence say, obviously limited in duration, and if not rehearsed, it's lost within 30 seconds. So that's why sing-songy things work. That's like repetition works. Oh, I can remember, I hate to say this and people cringe probably, but I don't know about you, but when I was in school, we had to write our time tables, we got talking, I can multiply and divide like nobody's business. I know y'all find that hard to believe, but finding that idea of 
what I could do with working memory and, and how my memory works. Maybe I was just lucky to have, uh, you know, people make sure that I knew how to do my mathematics and my addition and subtraction. <laughs> I don't struggle with fractions either, so that's good. <laughs> and then that limited in capacity idea, a small number of elements, like seven or four, you know, when we think about those things. And, you know, I always talk to people too about um, on these things is, why do you think the phone number is the way it is? It's so we can remember, right? You know, if you remember, I probably can remember my first phone number. Can any of you remember your first phone number? It was set up in a way that you can conjure it up from long-term memory. And they did tests. That's why they don't have, you know, numbers that are over a set amount of 10, right? Six and three, three and four, six and 10. So, so the total number being 10 in that regard too. And so when we think about this evidence related to working memory, it's like, again, very, very limited. And we think about um, this novel or novice information. This is when it's so important to use explicit and direct instruction. Explicit direct instruction is not really used once you have learned the information, right? This is at that foundational component where we're getting to build that bit background information and trying to really um, let kids see where we're at and how they can really demonstrate their, their understanding of the basic of the knowledge that we're trying to get them through that novel information. And when we continue through this, we just keep thinking of this working memory piece is it's not limited when dealing with organized information stored in long-term memory. And sometimes it's partially or minimally guided instruction typically is ineffective for novices, but can be effective for experts. So again, really understanding where you're at with the information you're giving, like is this basic information for kids? And I think that's probably the struggle right now with kids having such gaps in their learning from the last three years. And people are really struggling like, oh, these stuff these kids should know, but really Maybe they don't. And those, I uh, was that pre uh, pre test is a great way to kind of figure out where everybody's at and understanding that, especially for mathematics. But understanding here too, um, the things that are ineffective for novices, but can be really effective for experts. And some folks had questions earlier. It might be that it's an expert and, and the information works. So maybe problem based learning works. You have a lot to talk about and you can go in and solve the problems because you have the background knowledge. So let's kind of do this. This is the pause and ponder where we're trying to take things from short-term to long-term memory. You got a piece of paper in front of you you might want to write it down or feel free to drop it in the chat box. Did you have any aha so far? And is there any question that you still need answered? And Maureen, I still have you on my list. So I know your question we'll talk about at the very end. So any ahas or things you're like, oh. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. We're just trying to get some discussion going. Maureen, my RTI kiddos don't have the multiplication facts memorized, knowing that rehearsal and memorization is an effective practice. I may start having them skip counting. Absolutely. I, I, you know, and that's a big thing. Anita's thing is she goes, meaningful practice is important, right? We can't just assume kids get this. And, and sometimes we don't have the depth that we need. And so Maureen in, in her practice, and it's coming up, I do, we do, you do, right? That's the idea of explicit instruction. It's that simple. But sometimes it's, I do, I do, I do. I'm still doing it. I do, I do, I do. Because kids aren't catching it yet. We have to give them examples enough till they can, we can slowly, you know, move them from um, mass to scaffold the information over so they can do it. And then we can, you know, do it together. How do things like math talks fit into this? The idea of students explaining the strategy they used. Well, that's for you because you can identify, obviously, you know, what they're thinking is, right? So they either are getting it or they're not. And if it's basic information that they're not getting, you know that, huh, I probably need to provide direct, ex direct explicit instruction if I haven't already, right? Um, well, Michael says it's common sense that experts need less and novices need more. Boy, Michael, you touched on one of my things. There's a whole lot of no common sense in this world these days. So while I think that's important, I would say that's probably a suicide. You're assuming that people have common sense, right? And that doesn't always happen. I'm sure you don't work with anybody that doesn't have common sense, right? <laughs> right. So I'm never either. Never in the state of Illinois have I worked with anybody that didn't have common sense. So absolutely. It seems so simple though, right? That's I'm totally with you. And sometimes when I do these, I'm like, I just think, wow, haven't we come farther than this? <laughs> All right. So here's your thing, novices and experts. So um, as Michael stated, it seems like common sense, right? So novices, um, what's the evidence for novices versus experts? Novices only resources their very constrained working memory. So if we overload that working memory, you know, it's the fire hose and we give all this information up front. We don't scaffold it. And kids are just like, you can just see the deer in the headlight look. 
um, or we assume that they had information and we just jump to the next concept or we jump to a concept that's next that doesn't pertain and they had no background or anything on this information. And it could be cultural. It could be that kids just didn't have the information. It could be that they struggled with whatever in the classroom and they just didn't have that direct explicit understanding. And the experts have both their working memory and all the relevant knowledge and skills stored in long-term memory. So maybe you're starting to see where this argument of the myth is going, right? So everybody's like, but I thought problem-based learning. Well, you can see why. I definitely want to work with novices, right? You really have to have the understanding to solve a problem. And so when we continue through this, we talk about the struggling learners part of this. You know, research almost universally supports explicit instruction practices. And again, this builds on this idea of our second webinar having direct information about explicit instruction and why we build up this argument to why with novices, explicit instruction is one of the best things that you can do. And here's all the research that's really shown over the past years, my goodness, over and over and over, um, why it's particularly good for students that are, they say naive in the research or struggling learners. And again, if we don't realize that and we don't think about being explicit and direct, because again, I've sat in classrooms as a, as a building principal even and said, I'm not quite sure what they're doing in this lesson, right? Because it wasn't an explicit instruction, right? And I'm an adult. <laughs> so again, what should we do about this? And what are, what are our thoughts moving forward on this? And it's, it goes back to that idea, you know, and it says here, when academic literacy skills are taught, explicit instruction should be provided. And so again, academic literacy skills, when we're teaching new concepts that kids probably don't know and aren't exposed to, they are novice in, in, in that. This is the time that explicit instruction is so important. Um, and, and then it goes in again. So all the folks that have found this, the explicit instruction involves direct teaching, teacher modeling, guided practice with feedback, independent student practice. And again, it's just as simple as I do, we do, you do, but how do we construct that I do, we do framework in our classroom? And it, it's different with every group of kids that you have. And so it goes back to that systemic instructional process that they're talking about here. And again, a gradual release of responsibility. You're starting out yourself, you're demonstrating, you're going over the information, then you're gradually releasing it to students, and then they are independently doing it on their, on their own. And the research is there to support it. So I don't think we need to pause and ponder again, because I think that was pretty self-explanatory. But I think the thing on, uh, on here is, again, we want to know about explicit instruction. It's obviously modeling. That's the I do it part. The guided practice is the we do it part. The independent practice is you do it part. And again, I always love when teachers would give homework on content they never gave any instruction on. Michael, you got anything on that one? Common sense, right? Why would you give kids homework on something that they've never been, you know, the instruction they've never been taught on? Because that kind of defeats the purpose of homework or, or, or why you're doing some of the things. And so independent practice is something that they've mastered. You want them to go back and practice it and move it again, short-term memory to long-term memory. And so trying to think about those things um, as we go through it. Feedback always shows up, gradual transfer release of responsibility. And those transfers of responsibility occur right in between here, right? And then scaffolding in case through here, we might need to scaffold some of the things that we're doing to move on. Cause sometimes I told you it's the, I do, I do, I do. I'm still doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. No one's getting it. I got to either change my strategy or provide some scaffolding or some background information to kind of make it successful. And then teacher, um, teacher student interaction. So those are the pieces of that component. And then these are all the resources of resources I always include because people always have questions about something else they want to read further. So there's a couple pages here for deeper dives. And then we're going to go on and think about here's the problem based learning piece that everybody wants to make sure that we get an opportunity to talk about. So obviously problem based learning, let's just kind of go into that. Um, obviously, folks know that it's an authentic problem that acquires complex knowledge, information rich settings, and it's based on assumptions that having learners construct their own solutions leads to the most effective learning experience. Okay, so and I'm sure folks are doing this. It's, it's not that um, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that one, it has a lower effect. And two, when you're setting it up, if kids don't have background knowledge and they aren't experts on this problem, it's kind of hard for them to kind of move that problem through. And I get, oh, they'll research it and they'll do this and they'll do that. And you kind of saw the results of, is it a time, you know, is it taking time away from something that perhaps at this time when we know we need to kind of shore up some gaps that we have, is that what we want to do? Or is it more, and don't get me wrong, People love this. People love solving problems. They love doing this components of it. But I think this is a strategy that always was used with gifted kids. And now I kind of get it because they always, they were such experts in certain areas that they wanted to dive deeper in.
And so it totally worked for kids like that. They already had that. They were, and if not, they were going to the library, they're going to pull all the stuff they could read and they were going to be uh, perseverating on that for the whole year. <laughs> so just trying to think through when is it, you know, what it is in this instance. And these kind of cover the quotes of um, thinking about Again, reiterating, if background necessary knowledge is not there and it's not present, investigative or authentic, authentic tasks often are ineffective. So these are the things I just kind of want you to think about when you're kind of design, designing information for your students. And again, time is of the essence anymore and trying to find a way that we control what is the information that we provide and provide a really good foundation for kids and making sure that we don't just jump to things like this when we know that they don't have or haven't received direct explicit instruction in the content and having that background knowledge to be effective. Um, again, uh, we just kind of provide the information at the bottom here so you know where to go and if you want to read a little more about the problem-based learning thing. Again, I mean, this almost makes people cry when they see the real effect for problem-based learning. And it wasn't, it was Hattie and Zyre that kind of found it in 2018. And he had had it earlier on his chart as, as well. But if you think through it, here's what really and, and here's the piece as well. Um, this is the direct quote from their piece. If you want to take a minute to take a look, because all I do is uh, chat at you at this when you have a time. It's obviously, it's just kind of going through again um, about problem-based learning will have an effect only if the learners have already acquired the necessary knowledge base to complete the task at levels of transfer and problem solving. And so again, I just like people to kind of think that through. Um, this is when it works like so well, somebody said well, well how does it work well if we do explicit instruction knowledge vocabulary skills and strategies that we really want them to have before we can jump into an application right and the application could be an authentic problem but we've kind of not just started with problem-based learning and threw them into the problem we've had that direct explicit instruction here and then we've taken it to that next level does that make sense to folks because now it's not novice information and again, students learn better when they're taught using their preferred learning style. This one, I was the one, I think we spent millions of dollars on learning styles. And uh, the assumption is each of us has a specific learning style or pre preference. Boy, I can't talk today. And we learn best when information is presented in that style. Okay, well, you're gonna be surprised. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Okay, so I'm the visual kid, right? I have to see it done. I have to see math. I, if, they don't go to the board, they don't do it. I, I was the kid that never got it. I'm like, if they say just do the questions one, do the odd one through 20, I was like, oh. And I had to be the kid that goes to the board or uses the whiteboard or has somebody directly show me that um, and understand that. But I also knew that only 25% of the world teaches that way. So can you imagine like only 25% of the world teaches visually? And there's a lot of us that are visual, but some people aren't visual. The assumption is that your given students have different learning styles that teachers should group students by learning styles to maximize their learning. So what do you think about that? What are your thoughts about given that students have different learning styles that teachers should group students by learning style to maximize it? Have you ever heard that? Just curious. So the evidence says neither modality testing nor modality teaching were shown to be effective, right? So in the research that it, it, it made no, <laughs> it made no sense. Sounds complicated and ineffective, right? Exactly. I agree, Bridget. And so trying to figure these kinds of things out, it, it's, it's kind of proven to be, but boy, let me tell you, it was the buzzword 20 years ago. That's all that, you know, got to get their learning styles. You're not teaching to their learning styles or you're having parents say, you know, you're not addressing his learning styles. I'm like, okay, well, maybe you don't want me to address his learning styles because we're never going to get anywhere. So here is again, more of the evidence of why and what happens is that, you know, there was a conversation in the psychological sciences that said, hey, we wanna take a look at some of this stuff and we're gonna have these folks take a look at it, research learning styles to determine whether there's a credible evidence to support learning styles and instruction. It was a huge study. And so the, the, the quote to note, it's normally the summary findings and the thing It's the contrast between the enormous populator of learning styles approach within education and the lack of credible evidence for using it in its utility is in our opinion, striking and disturbing. So honestly, I don't know that I've ever read uh, anything that said it was striking and disturbing. That's how out of touch and overblown this learning styles got. And so when they take, took a look at it, I'm like, holy moly, look at all the amount of money I could think of that they had of uh, textbooks, lessons, trainings, all this gathered around learning styles. And then we come to find out one, there's no effect. And two, we wasted a gazillion dollars trying to find out what these learning styles were. 
So what should we do, right? So given the lack of scientific evidence, the use of learning styles, tests, and teaching tools is a waste of useful limited education resources. I totally agree with this one. Normally, I'm never like throw it all out. But this one, if you're still stuck in those learning style things, I don't know that it's a, something that's going to give you the bang for your buck. And, and here's where it might. And it's totally different. It's, it, it defeats the purpose of learning styles. But what it does do is provide multi-modalities across, right? So when we teach, we think about these things. Like I'm visual, but I also enjoy, you know, um, things auditorily. Um, some folks like it kinesthetically, or there's a match of it. And just having an awareness of these things, if you think of this column, visual, everything down here, boy, I was fantastic at geometry. But if you would ha have me do, and handwriting, probably shouldn't sing in front of you or do that kind of stuff, but I did play piano. So it, you kind of think through these things of what your strengths are and giving kids choices and, and, and when you design lessons, sure, that might be something that would provide uh, more of a, a optimal point. And this is, they say an obvious point is that the optimal instructional method is likely to vary across disciplines, right? So we're giving them some choices across, not necessarily just teaching to that learning style. And again, provide multiple exposures, a variety of methods and modalities. And so their example they give is football. Visual, you watch the football game, read about the football plays, the auditory, you listen to the coach, kinesthetic, you play football. And they did a TED ed on this, obviously learning styles. And it kind of went through this and, and trying to understand, thinking how these things would work through. And so you go back to what should we do again then? And it says, remember content stored in terms of meaning. So provide deliberate practice. So I think everybody, no matter what you're teaching right now, you could think about that. Provide space practice, right? So you give some information, you wait a little while, then you go back and you provide some more practice on it and you provide retrieval practice. So, you know, you do a lesson on Monday, but maybe on Friday, you go back in and say, now remember on Monday when we covered such and such, because you're wanting to make sure you're testing that. And again, somebody said muscle memory here, you're, you're able to go in and retrieve information and, and really building that muscle memory in kids. So they're able to um, have those in long-term memory, but you got to do this. And this is what it says, you know, the deliberate practice, space practice and retrieval practice. And sometimes we forget about giving kids chances to practice. And we think, well, we got to be doing something all the time. Well, this is the doing something. This is that I do, we do, you do. This is the you do, right? So we're trying to get through that. Um, obviously on this one, it's just making sure that again, we're capable of learning from many styles. We don't pigeonhole kids into anything particular and we're more of the same than we are different, right? So while I say I'm a visual learner, um, there's probably many kids that have said that. So <laughs> there's many learning styles. And so again, here's the information for you guys. If you wanna do deeper dives, learn a little bit more about any of these. And I guess, again, I go to this pause and ponder. And even though I rushed through this stuff for you guys, I, I always feel like this pause and ponder is, you know, what ahas did you have? What information um, are you are you talking through? And what information are you able to maybe move from short term to long term memory? And what questions do you still need still need asked? <clears throat> and Maddie just posted a thing up here for us. It says, uh, Daniel Willingham, cognitive psychologist has some great explanations about the research on learning styles. Thanks, Maddie. I appreciate it. And then quick chat, any ahas over all this? As Shelly, God bless you. Very interesting info. The evidence should drive districts and teachers' decisions, but the wheel is slow. Yeah, then it's not any faster in state government or federal government or anywhere. It might be slower even. So, but it's important to have evidence, right? And if you can set these up so no one's offended, like we just present the information and then, you know, here's the, here's the issue. Here's what Hattie's works found and have conversation around some of those things. That normally starts the wheel to, but people are very, you know, it's behavior, right? I, I, I stink at diets. If I could learn to be a, a better eater, which I know I know how to do it, I just don't apply it. And so trying to think some of these things through, I think are very, very um, important how, how to get the wheel to move. Having Hattie's really help, great, Michael. Um, I would buy the book. It, it, I'm telling you, it is fantastic. And you, it's almost on anything you can think of. Like those were just literally maybe a couple of things that were covered, that little chart was. I know I've kind of gone over and uh, I'm kind of going to the chat box here, but I did get to the last slide. I'm five minutes late. I apologize for that. But I wanted to let everybody know too that when we wrap up here, we do, um, we do another one in December, I think here on the 13th. Um, and that's, uh, it, we're, it's actually seeing explicit instruction in action, right? And um, the fourth webinar we'll do in January, it's skills and strategies that are part of explicit instruction. Um, for those that are leaders in the building application of walkthroughs to 
schools focusing on explicit instruction. And, you know, again, just because you give people training on it doesn't mean it's being applied in the classrooms. So we're kind of going to talk through that. And then the last one is how, um, how explicit instruction addresses intrinsic and extrinsic cognitive loads. It's all about that, you know, what, how we know to teach smarter, not harder kind of things. And I don't know, it, and Michael had a great point. It just seems all common sense, but here we are talking about it, right? And hopefully maybe inspiring folks to be excited about taking a look at um, some research and some processes related to implementing explicit instruction in your school. Julie, yes, absolutely. I, it'll come, actually it'll come with a recording tomorrow and you'll get the handout with it. Great to hear it, Sandy, I'm glad to hear. Um, we ran the MTSS Center out in Boise when I was at Boise State University. So I'm really excited to see that. And, and it is, once you get it in place and you do it right, sometimes things just get implemented incorrectly. And then that get, the RTI piece gets a bad name and it is labor intensive, don't get me wrong. So you really have to think through, but once you get it in place, it's great. Thanks, Lindsay, I appreciate it. Any questions, any further things you guys need from me? Exciting, I'm really glad to see the one. Man, if I had known this my first year in teaching, I was thinking the same thing, I would be killer right now. But you know, I, I said the things that we implemented in the district that I I, I was um, the curriculum leader in, um, it was almost 20 years ago, was stuff that we knew was solid in, in, in research and it still, still applies. So awesome. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Hope you can join us maybe on the webinar on the 13th in December. Sorry, I plowed through it. <laughs> I normally give you more time to think and reflect. No, we definitely appreciate your time, Gina. Thank you for putting all this in here and dispelling some old myths in education with us this afternoon. Uh, as Gina said, this has been recorded. I will be following up tomorrow with a link to the recording and a link to the handout. I can put a link to the handout in the chat right now. Uh, let That'd me be great, sure Arlen. Right. Here it is. And I'll be sending a link to the uh, recording, the handout, and an evaluation that when you complete, our Illinois participants will get the ISBE Evidence of Completion form, and you will get one professional development clock hour for attending today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.